There's an old saying, all's fair in love and war. But it isn't true. War has always had rules. Sometimes these codes of conduct were based upon personal opinions and beliefs as to how a battle should be conducted. And as humanity advanced in culture and technology, so too did these opinions, which in turn became law. Two problems have always been a thorn in the side of those who believe in there being laws and treaties governing conduct during wartime. The first is that laws are often open to interpretation, and so two combatants can act totally opposed to one another, yet still argue they were in the right. This of course leads to the other problem. Why should one country continue following the rule of law if their enemy does not? In today's episode, we are going to examine a case from the Great War, in which the rules of international law were brought into question in order to defeat a seemingly merciless enemy that acted without conscience. This is the story of the Barralong Incident. Welcome to Wars of the World. World War I saw the technology of the Industrial Revolution applied to the terrible art of warfare, but with little or no experience in such matters, the generals and admirals commanding thousands of men often had to learn how this new kind of war worked on the job. Mistakes were many, and the costs appalling. Perhaps the most feared, and certainly the most underestimated new weapon at the start of the war was the submarine. For centuries, navies had seen the mighty ships of the line, the battleships, which grew larger and more powerful with each generation, reign supreme, and so it was unfathomable to their still Victorian minds that the comparatively dinky little submarines could ever really challenge the great battle fleets. Quickly in war, they were proven spectacularly wrong. The threat the submarine posed, particularly by German U-boats to Britain, whose people had been assured that no matter what happened in Europe, they would always be safe on their island, came as a terrible shock that left the public crying out for a response. Like many inventions making their introduction into the armed conflict in 1914, just how to combat the submarines was met with suggestions from the plausible to the downright absurd. One suggestion seriously considered by the British, for example, would have seen dozens of high-speed motorboats circling the fleet, the men on board armed with shoe polish, with the idea being that once a periscope was spotted, they would rush over to it, smearing the polish over the lens and blinding the U-boat commander. Again, it seems absurd now, but in 1914, anything was seen as better than doing nothing. A convoy system was yet to be introduced, and torpedoes were sometimes ineffective. So many unguarded merchant ships were attacked by U-boats on the surface with deck guns, often inspecting the target vessel first for war materials in order to be justified in the sinking. This gave the British the idea of creating a fleet of ships that resembled tempting targets for a U-boat, but which were actually armed with 12-pounder guns and Maxim machine guns. As well as being disguised as merchant ships, these vessels, known as Q-ships, would also controversially fly under a false flag, such as that of a neutral country, to further lure in an unsuspecting U-boat, and then, at the last moment, hoist the British white ensign before opening fire. While the Q-ship was a response to the need to counter the U-boat menace, the concept in of itself was not a wholly new one, as Rear Admiral Gordon Campbell said in his memoirs, my mystery ships. It must not be imagined that the mystery ships were any invention of the war, as attempts to decoy the enemy are as old as can be. The hoisting of false colours is a long-standing practice, and it is only natural that enterprising officers would go a bit farther and disguise their ships and think of additional ruses. In order to create the Q-ships, a number of cargo vessels were requisitioned by the Admiralty for conversion to their new, deadly role. 
One such vessel was the 13-year-old, 4,192-ton steam cargo ship, Barralong, built on the River Tyne in northeast England by Armstrong, Whitworth & Co., and operated by Bucknell Steamship Lines Limited. In order to take on its new, deadly role, Barralong was fitted with three 12-pounder guns located in concealed mounts that would fall open when the time came to engage the enemy. Further emphasizing its deceptive nature, Barralong was also fitted with devices designed to simulate damage as part of an effort to lure in a U-boat commander looking for an easy kill. Work was completed in April of 1915, and the now HMS Barralong was ready to join the fleet and begin its deadly work. Command of the HMS Barillon was given to 31-year-old Commander Godfrey Herbert, himself a seasoned member of Britain's own submarine service, and in this regard was considered a poacher-turned-gamekeeper in that his own experience on submarines made him ideal for hunting them down. He knew their strengths, weaknesses, and tactics. From an early age, Herbert was set for a career in the Royal Navy, attending Stubbington House Preparatory School, known as the Cradle of the Service, before becoming a naval cadet, and then finally a midshipman in 1900. Hoping to fast-track his career in order to stand out, he applied to join the growing submarine service in 1903, and ended up serving aboard one of Britain's first operational submarines, HMS A4, under the command of future Victoria Cross recipient, Lieutenant Eric Naismith. On October 16th, 1905, both men and their crew of nine naval ratings became trapped when their submarine sunk during a signaling exercise. Both men were praised for their calm reactions to the incident, which no doubt saved all 11 lives on board, although the A4 was seriously damaged. In February of 1911, Herbert, commanding his own submarine, HMS C-36, undertook a record-breaking deployment when the vessel sailed to the Far East, reaching the Royal Navy's China Station. Like many of his compatriots in the early days of the British submarine service, as far as British officers went, Herbert was a maverick, and by no means afraid to get his hands dirty. By the outbreak of the war, he had transferred to HMS D5 and made an attack on the German light cruiser Rostock, However, the torpedoes he fired missed their target because of an error in his calculations. He soon learned that the live weapons weighed heavier than the training ones he had been used to. Rostock would later be scuttled at the Battle of Jutland. A few months later, on November 3rd, 1914, D5 received word of the raid on Yarmouth and was ordered to pursue the German force of three battle cruisers, four light cruisers, and a single armed cruiser, led by the battle cruiser Seydlitz. During the pursuit, D5 struck a mine and within a minute had sunk to the bottom, with only five of its 25 crew surviving, including Herbert. While generally agreed that the mine was one left by the fleeing German force, some historians, who would later write Herbert's biography, argued it was a British mine that had broken free and wandered into the path of the D5. With no submarines available for him to command, it was decided to transfer Herbert to the surface fleet, and in particular, aboard one of the new Q ships being converted in British yards. After briefly commanding HMS Antwerp, he was assigned to command the Barralong. It seemed that some of his more maverick ways from the submarine service followed him, for several sailors have testified that serving under Herbert was far more undisciplined than one typically experienced on board a Royal Navy ship. Rather than demanding his men behave themselves on shore leave, they were instead encouraged to go on drinking binges, leading to them destroying a pub in Dartmouth, for which several were arrested, with Herbert paying their bail before leaving port the next day. He also insisted they stop referring to him as Sir, and instead address him as Captain William McBride, which was part of the Barralong's cover story. It may have been the second decade of the 20th century, but the Victorian mindset on matters such as personal honour remained for British sailors. However, a reminder that those days were over came on May 7, 1915, when a German U-boat sank the liner RMS Lusitania, killing 1,193 people without warning. 
The incident appalled the world and put the United States on a path towards joining the war in the support of the Allies. It also had a major impact on the men in the Royal Navy, particularly those aboard the Q-ships, as questions began to be raised about whether or not the crews from captured U-boats deserved to be treated like any other prisoners of war. Many were calling for captured U-boat men to be executed as war criminals, although British commanders formally disapproved of this notion, as it would discourage U-boats from surrendering. There was also the issues of retaliation against British sailors captured by the Germans, and regarding the optics of executing prisoners and how it would be perceived by neutral countries, most importantly the United States, where a great many of its citizens had German heritage. Nevertheless, tempers were such that in the wake of the Lusitania sinking, Herbert was quietly relayed a message verbally from the admirals above him that in their opinion, it was most undesirable to take any enemy submarine prisoners. In August, Herbert and his crew of U-boat hunters were sailing the Baralong off the coast of Ireland on a routine patrol for the Q-ship, when on August 19th, they received a distress signal from the White Star Line's RMS Arabic. The German U-boat U-24 had spotted the liner sailing near the old head of Kinsale, off the coast of County Cork, and sank it with a torpedo attack. The damage was such that the vessel sank within nine minutes, not far from where Lusitania had gone down earlier in the year, although thankfully the loss of life was significantly fewer, only 44 of those on board being killed. Baralong raced to the scene, but instead of the U-24, the Q-ship instead found another U-boat, U-27. In the process of stopping the liner SS Nicosian, bound to England from the United States, carrying munitions, mules, and their American handlers. The captain of U-27, Bernard Wegener, sent a boarding party to inspect the vessel's cargo, and upon discovering the war material on board, ordered the crew off with the intention of sinking it. Exactly how events unfolded that day remain mired in controversy, and the facts have been modeled by opinion, but the generally agreed upon sequence of events goes like this. Baralong approached the scene, flying American colors, and signaled to the U-27 that it intended to rescue the crew of the Nicosian. There is some debate as to whether the Nicosian still had crew members on board when Herbert arrived on the scene, or whether the U-27 had begun its shelling. But regardless, the Baralong, still wearing its American disguise, sailed on the Nicosian's starboard side, so that for a time, the vessel was briefly screened from the U-boat positioned on the Nicosian's port side. This allowed Herbert's men to drop the disguise by raising the British white ensign and uncovering their guns without interference. Thus, to Vergana's horror, when the approaching ship emerged from behind his target, he was greeted not by a neutral freighter, but by gunfire from an enemy warship. Historian Tony Brigland described the scene aboard Baralong as he believed it to have taken place with the following words. Herbert screamed, cease fire, but his men's blood was up. They were avenging the Arabic and the Lusitania. For them, this was no time to cease firing, even as the survivors of the crew appeared on the outer casing, struggling out of their clothes to swim away from her. There was a mighty hiss of compressed air from her tanks, and the U-27 vanished from sight in a vortex of giant rumbling bubbles, leaving a pall of smoke over the spot where she had been. It had taken only a few minutes to fire 34 shells into her. As many as 18 of the U-27's crew survived, including Wegener, with many of the survivors attempting to swim towards the Nicosian and the boarding party. Meanwhile, Herbert, fearing that they may attempt to sail the ship home or even scuttle it out of spite, ordered a machine gun crew to begin shooting the U-boat crew in the water. Some of the German soldiers did make it to the Nicosian, however, and so Herbert ordered his troop of Royal Marines to head to the vessel and take care of them. As they boarded their boats, Herbert is said to have told the Royal Marines to take no prisoners, and that's exactly what they did. Most of the survivors were found in the engine room and were quickly shot by the Royal Marines. Reports on Wegener's fate are confused, with some claiming he was shot trying to swim to the Nicosian, while another account had him shot while trying to surrender to the crew aboard the Baralong. Third account has him chased off the Nicosian by the Marines and then shot in the water, while another account has it that it was in fact the freighter's own engine crew 
who had killed the U-boat men. Regardless, the fact of the matter was that a largely helpless U-boat crew had been gunned down in cold blood, and it had been witnessed by the American mule handlers, who returned to the US with the story, which was then repeated and often embellished by the American press. It thus soon found its way to Germany. Herbert defended his actions in his after-action report, claiming that he acted solely in defense of British interests, and that anything less would have constituted negligence on his part. The British Admiralty seemed to agree, although they did order his report to be covered up at first, but of course they couldn't censor the American witnesses. Again, such was the mood in Britain regarding the U-boats, that few had sympathy for the German soldiers killed by the Baralong's crew. However, the manner in which they were killed didn't sit right with some, since surely a U-boat crew is no threat in the water when their U-boat has already been sunk. In Germany, the mood was very different. They viewed the entire incident as a war crime, and Captain William McBride was added to the German list of Englishmen they considered guilty of such acts, unaware of Herbert's real name. Communicating through American diplomatic channels, the German government demanded the crew be handed over for trial, but the request was rebuffed with the British Foreign Secretary Edward Grey, telling them that they would have to hand over U-boat crews who attacked without warning in return. Following the incident, Herbert was transferred back to the submarine service, while command of the Baralong was transferred to Lieutenant Commander A. Wilmot Smith. Barely a month after the U-27 had been sunk, Baralong, under Wilmot Smith, sank another U-boat, U-41, in the approaches to the English Channel. In this case, the only survivor from the sinking reported to his German leaders that the Baralong had kept its American flag flying when it opened fire, a blatant violation of international law. Then, hours later, the Q ship deliberately rammed their lifeboat, killing another survivor, although again the details of what happened are contested. The entire Baralong affair remains a contentious topic, not helped by the fact that some details are disputed. What can't be denied, however, is that despite efforts to legalize, and some may say sanitize war with international treaties and laws, it will always be a messy business that costs lives, and that is why it must always be a last resort.